Okay, well, so, so far we've been talking about regression trees. The, the response was quantitative, salaries in this case of, of uh, baseball players. Um, oftentimes, trees are used when the response is a, a categorical variable, and so then we call those uh, classification trees. But you'll see the, the technology is, is very similar, and we just have to change the, essentially the loss function and how we measure uh, good performance. So let's see how that goes. So we're going to predict in a classification tree um, each observation belonging to the most commonly occurring class. Um, so that's what's going to happen in the, in the terminal node of the tree. As, and instead of uh, just giving the prediction being the mean, we're going to classify to the most uh, common class. We're going to grow the tree in a very same way as we did for, class, for regression trees. Um, but we don't use residual sum of squares as a, as a criterion for making the splits. We need a criterion that's more geared towards classification. So one thing you can do is at each internal node, you can just look at the classification error rate. And, and that's easy to compute. Um, so suppose, um, suppose class K, um, I beg your pardon. So suppose you've got capital K classes and you compute the proportion um, in the terminal node in each of the classes from 1 up to capital K. Well, the class you're going to classify is going to is the class that's, that's got the largest of those probabilities, those proportions, and the error you're going to make is going to be 1 minus that maximum. Right? So the, all the ones that don't belong to the maximal class are going to be counted as errors. So you could use that to, to decide on the split, um, and so that's the proportion of errors you're going to make. But it turns out that that's a little bit jumpy and noisy, and it's not very, uh, it doesn't lead to a very um, uh, a smooth tree growing process. And for that reason, some other measures are preferable. One measure is the GINA index, and it's a kind of variance measure uh, across the classes. So you've got K classes, capital K classes, often K is two, but not necessarily. And this, if, if for those who know the binomial distribution, this is each of the terms here is like a binomial variance, and in fact, for the multinomial, this is the diagonal of the, the these are on the diagonal of the covariance matrix. So this this is a measure of total variability um, in the in that region, and if the Gini index is really small, what that means is pretty much one class is is favoured, and all the rest are really small. Whereas in extreme case, Trevor, right, if the region is pure, so it's all one class, then the, one of those p-hats will be 1, the rest will be 0, and g will be 0. That's a good, that's a good point. And, and on the other hand, if, I guess if they're all equally distributed in the classes, this g index will be maximum. And, and, but it, moves in a, in a, it, it changes in a smooth way. So that's one of the, the, the criteria that are very popular. Um, and it it's also known as a purity index. It measures the purity of the class. Um, an alternative is, is the deviance or cross entropy. And this is based on the binomial log likelihood or the multinomial log likelihood. And it's a measure that behaves rather similarly to, to the Gini index. And either of these are used and, and give very similar results. So let's look at an example. We'll look at the heart data. These data have a binary response um, called HD. There's 303 patients, and they're all represented with chest pains. So the outcome has a value yes, indicates the presence of heart disease based on an angiographic test, while no means no heart disease. For these data, there are 13 predictors, amongst them age, sex, cholesterol, and other heart and lung function measurements. And so we, grew, we ran the tree growing process with cross-validation, and we see what we get in the next figure. At the top, you see the full tree grown to, to all the data, and you can see it's quite a bushy tree um, with an early split, uh, split on thal. It's actually it's a, it's a thallium stress test. A thallium stress test, okay. And, and then... The two, the left and right nodes were split on, on CA. Uh, which, calcium, I think. Which is calcium. And, and then the subsequent splits, it's, it's hard to see here. But you go, um, this, these pictures are in the book. So quite a bushy tree. And you see at the terminal nodes of, of this tree are 
the, the, the classification is no or yes. So that means an observation that, for example, ended up in this leftmost terminal node here, the majority in that class were no's, no heart disease, and so the classification produced would be a no. Um, whereas the, the right-hand one here is a yes. Um, interesting, this terminal node has two no's. So if they both pre predicted no, why was there a split here at all? Well, it must mean that one of these nodes is purer than the other. So even though they were both ended up having a majority of no's, the one node was purer than the other node. And the GINA index would identify such, such a node. So this tree is probably too bushy. And so once again, cross-validation was used. And again, we see in the right-hand panel the results of cross-validation. And we see the, the training error, the test error, and the validation error. Here we've actually looked at the training error averaged over each of the cross-validation folds, which is why um, it's, it's a little jumpy um, and actually even increases in, in one point here because the trees and the architecture of the trees are different in each of the folds. Um, the cross-validation and, um, and test error, we had a left out test set here as well. Those curves look pretty much the same and we end up seeing that a tree size of around about six um, tends to, to do well. These bars on these cross-validation and, and test curves are standard error bars, so there's quite a bit of variability here. The data set's not that big. And on the right here, we see the pruned back tree um, that's pruned back to size 6. Of course, the pruning was again governed by the, the cost compl uh, complexity uh, parameter alpha. And this year will be a subtree of, of the big tree grown, um, and that gave the best classification performance, which is estimated to be around about 25% um, error in this case. Um, in, this, in this figure, we, we, show, um, we compare trees with linear models. Trees aren't always the right thing to do. And so to contrast that, we look at two different scenarios. In, in, this, in these cartoons here, the, the truth is indicated by these two colors. In this top left panel, the truth is actually best depicted by a linear model. So the decision boundary, in this case, be between the two classes um, is best given by a line. Okay, And in this case, a tree is not going to do very well. We see a, tree, a tree's attempt to partition this space. And you know, while it, it, it does a valiant job, it just doesn't do well enough. Because it's, it's confined to pick boxy regions. Right, So there'd be a split over here. A split over there, and then this region was subdivided, then that region was subdivided, in an attempt to get at this linear decision boundary. So this would be classified as, as, as uh, beige, this would be classified as green, beige, green, and so on in a steppy, in a steppy fashion. On the other hand, in the lower, in the lower two panels, the, the optimal region is um, a, a blocky kind of partition region. And here a linear model is not going to do well. In the left panel, we see the best linear approximation to this decision boundary, and it's going to make lots of errors because, you know, with a one single linear boundary, it's hard to approximate a rectangular region like this. And of course, in this one, a tree will nail it. So it'll, with two splits, it can get the decision boundary perfectly. So some problems are more naturally suited to trees, some problems aren't. And so the idea is we're going to think of trees as one tool in our toolbox, and we'll, we'll use it where appropriate. But of course, we'll also bear in mind simpler linear models um, as well. So to, just to wrap up the section on trees then, uh, we've seen some, there's advantages and disadvantages. In a sense, they're simple if, if the trees are, uh, are small, not too many terminal nodes, because they're easy to display and to uh, understand for non-specialists. And for example, if we look back at this heart disease tree, right? Um, the prune one in the bottom right. Um, a doctor m might like this tree because it, 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 it mimics, in a sense, the way his decision making process might work. In other words, trying to decide whether a patient has heart disease, he might first do an initial test on, based on thallium stress test. And if they fail that test, then do a further test based on calcium and decide about heart disease. If the, if the test was um, passed, we might, again, do a calcium test and then f uh, fall by some other criteria. So 
you stratify the population in, in a series of simple rules to try to determine whether a patient is of high or low risk. So for that reason, it's trees are popular because of the, 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 their simplicity and the fact that they, they, they mimic the way some people make decisions as a series of, of, uh, of splits. And they can, they can be displayed in a simple tree, which means, again, they're attractive because there aren't equations to have to understand. They can also ha handle qualitative predictors without the need to, ha to create dummy variables. In other words, uh, some of the categorical variables can be, have more than two levels, and we can, you can split a, ca a categorical variable into two sets of subcategories. So these are all good things. The big downside is that the, um, they don't predict so well compared to, to, uh, to, to more uh, state-of-the-art methods. And we'll see, for example, for the heart data, that the, 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 predict, the prediction accuracy of a tree is not very good compared to, to other methods. The other methods we'll talk about now actually use trees, but in an, an ensemble. They combine trees. Uh, they build m many trees on the same data, and then c they average or combine them in some way, and in the process, they improve the prediction area substantially.